You've just entered the Disaster Tough podcast, the place for emergency managers, first responders, and humanitarians who want to get the job done. Stories, lessons, and tips are provided by field experts. I'm your host, John Scardina, owner of Doberman Emergency Management and former federal emergency response official who's responded to some of the most extreme disasters. Disaster Tough is our mantra. It combines experience, training, and analytics in order to be successful at any stage within the disaster life cycle. It means being a professional in emergency and disaster services. Doberman Emergency Management lives by this. If your organization needs to fill a gap, please contact us. We can help. Contact info is in the show notes. We also support other products and organizations that will increase your ability. For example, if you fight wildfires, hurricanes, a pandemic, any disaster in the field, at a hospital or command center, listen up. You're missing out if you do not use L3 Harris for your radio comms. They are secure, portable, mobile, and scalable, which is great news for us in the field. A truly disaster tough radio system. Check out the XL family of radios by clicking on the show notes or simply go to L3Harris.com. When you think of situational awareness, you need to think of Futurity IT. They are disaster tough because they saw a gap and figure out how to close it by creating the Orion and Athena applications. Situational awareness is all about speed, coordination, and accuracy of information. Futurity IT's Orion app collects and provides preliminary damage assessments and integrates all incident action plan documents with WebEOC. The Athena app allows for planning, contact tracing, and customizable group coordination in every single phase of the disaster lifecycle. The best part? Futurity IT made both applications extremely intuitive. It's so easy to use. Click on the show notes today to schedule a free demo. Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's your host, John Scardina. I am so excited for this episode. For an entire year, I have been preaching the importance of messaging. Messaging has been critical during COVID-19. There has been a lot of lessons learned. Oh, like, oh my gosh, like messaging comes down to, to really focusing on our efforts and how to focus those efforts. And if that gets messed up, then they know the disaster becomes exponentially bad. So Messaging is extremely important. Today, I have the former director of external affairs, Jesse Nalepa, on here, who's actually now with Haggerty. So we had Brock on here a few weeks ago, as you heard. So Haggerty, big fan of them. So she's now there with the comms director, I believe. And so she can talk all about messaging. Jesse, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, John. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the, the, uh, the biggest problem here is Every episode, I find some way to bring up Hurricane Harvey, right? Mm-hmm. Hurricane Harvey was so impactful, so many reasons. And you joined FEMA just a few months before Hurricane Harvey. So can you kind of talk about that process of, okay, you, you came in here a couple months later, you had this crazy event. In fact, you had multiple events all happening at the same time. Talk to, talk to us about some of the things that passed that you were in charge of. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So as John mentioned, um, I had joined uh, FEMA three months before Hurricane Harvey. I was a political appointee in the former administration. So before that, I was on the Hill um, and had observed FEMA and did some oversight of FEMA uh, when I was on the Hill and, um, you know, thought I knew how the agency worked, but then you get into a 20,000 plus person agency with people all over the country and uh, you really don't. Uh, So I was just getting to learn the agency uh, had actually just taken my first uh, trip, official trip uh, with Brock Long. We had gone to Minot, North Dakota. And as we're on the flight back from Minot, North Dakota, I'm sitting next to him on the plane and he looks at me and he says, we're about to have a huge hurricane in the Gulf. And I looked at him and I'm like, okay, how do you know this about five, six, seven days out? Um, And sure enough, a couple days later, uh, the NRCC activated to a level one. Uh, We had teams deployed uh, down uh, to Texas and Louisiana in preparation. Um, And then shortly after that, after Hurricane Harvey made its detrimental impact, a couple of days later, there was Hurricane Irma, which, uh, you know, we like to kind of think about as the forgotten, uh, you know, cat four, um, but it it was a huge storm in and of its own right. Um, And then a couple of days later, you had um, Hurricane Maria, uh, and that was right on the heels of that. And all between all of that, you had the the, uh, California wildfires and the wildfires out west that were burning. So, Um, I think what I realized early on, um, you know, had Hurricane Harvey been an isolated incident, 
the communications, I think, in and of themselves would have been a little bit less challenging. Um, across the federal government, FEMA is not the only one that does the communications. We have to pull in the expertise from the other federal government agencies. And that's really what makes the whole operation work. Um, you know, at the federal level, all of those entities coming together and coordinating the communications is really important. But then you also have the state and local element of that too. Um, what I found was truly successful um, with Harvey and Irma and was a little bit more challenging with Maria was having that local and state integration into the process um, of communicating. Uh, it was a lot more challenging with Maria because of all of the um, challenges that were associated with the response. You had the, the communications challenges that were interwoven in that with the kind of electrical challenges as well as the um, you know, access to uh, services. And so it made it a lot more difficult for us to communicate um, about the challenges that were ongoing. Um, you know, but I, I think this is a good time to kind of use Brock's analogy um, that he always did when he was at FEMA. Um, you know, really the response is, is about the four legs of the chair. You really have to have all four legs present in order for it to work. You have to obviously have the, the federal support um, and that's what we do is coordinating the firepower of the federal government and communicating the challenges that exist and how to overcome them as a community. Um, but then you have to have the state and local element um, you know, to it as well. Um, then you have the private sector, um, which especially with Hurricane Maria was, was a big challenge. Um, and then you have uh, all the other supporting organizations, uh, the nonprofits and everything else that are supporting the community. Um, but then you also have the individuals. The individuals have to be a part of the equation and, and building a culture of preparedness, uh, which was also one of my responsibilities at FEMA. Um, and obviously we still have a long way to go there. <laughs> that was a, that was a great, great, way, great way to end the day. Yeah. So there, you brought up a couple things that, um, that I wrote down that I find fascinating. So we always stress, you know, it, on this show, really that emergency managers should be emergency coordinators. Mm -hmm. And when I was with FEMA, I switched roles. As people know, I switched from like an operations and planning perspective into GIS, a huge career shift. And so we can talk about that another time, but um, I really learned the, the value of every single stakeholder using the exact same data. We're all right or we're all wrong together, but we all need to come to the table and make a choice and move forward. I mean, that's, that's response, right? And you're talking about so many different disasters happening all at the same time. And that coordination piece that happens between all the federal and, and, and state and local, as you mentioned, I, I thought Har Hurricane Harvey did a great job that, it ran down issues very quick with messaging. Like, for example, I think I shared this uh, a while ago, but we had the FCO come up to me and he hands me a, a local news article that had published uh, what appeared to be a FEMA map of all the damage assessments. And he said, why did you share this? You know, basically. And I'm looking at it and I'm starting to like, so the, the, the copy, the, the text was, the, the font was different. Um, the, you know, the, all these stuff were these little, these little things that seemed different. And I went back and I started diving deep into it with uh, maybe four or five other people. And a local newspaper had taken a potential flood, ma uh, potential flood map from like 2009 and put the FEMA um, title on it for Hurricane Harvey. And then all of a sudden you have this this, this issue, right? And so why would a newspaper do that? I don't know. I'm not going to get into that. But it does show that that kind of stuff happens. And um, like, I, I think that's just so huge that you call that out. So let's talk about that like real quick then. If coordination is so important and you have all these stakeholders involved and you're dealing with the media who, for, you know, they, they don't always have our best intention, right? They're there to create a story. How do you work with that in external affairs? How do you control that message when there's a bombardment of false information out there? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it was extremely challenging, especially when you have so many different agencies that have a piece of the puzzle. Um, I think what made it very successful in 2017 and what we replicated the years after is that FEMA really was the hub for coordinating all of those media requests. So all the federal government was having to send their media requests to FEMA and we would either take the response or we would let them run with it and us kind of have visibility on what they were doing. Um, it was effective because we weren't tripping over each other. We weren't providing conflicting information. Um, but I think it's really important too when you're dealing with the media is having the facts before you go into the conversation. Um, you know, I think what we were very successful at um, 
you know, I would say 2017 and 2018, especially when we had multiple concurrent events, um, you know, having a team uh, that was dedicated to solving those specific issues in that disaster. So even when Maria happened, we had a small team of communications professionals that were still 100% focused on what was happening with Hurricane Harvey. Um, you know, so really trying to pivot um, and still have consistency in the messaging and the coordination that you're having with the media. Um, you know, un letting them understand that there's, you know, uh, there's a process. Um, I think that was the most challenging thing. FEMA is extremely complex agency. When you're dealing with a multi response or a multi recovery type scenario, um, you know, I think there's a lot of room for mis and disinformation to get out there, especially when you're dealing with the 24 hour news cycle, social media that we have today. Um, and so we, we also had a rapid response team that was responding to mis and disinformation um, on uh, our website um, in real time, keeping up a, um, a page, a rumor control page that was easy for the public to access. Um, we were tweeting out um, and, and responding to reporters if they were tweeting inaccurate information. Um, what's really critical, especially during a response, as you mentioned, is that information that's erroneous, um, you know, can be used in ways that could have life impacts on people. Um, and we were seeing uh, one example was during Hurricane Harvey, actually, um, the congressional line for FEMA um, for members of Congress and their staff to call in was being given out to victims who were um, actually trying to stay, you know, above water in their homes. Uh, and actually need a Coast Guard rescue or other, other rescue efforts. And so we had to work with the NRCC to get another way to route that information and really do a solid push with members of Congress and their staff who have been providing this information to their constituents. Um, you know, cause stuff like that, it, it's, it's a, you know, a matter of moments sometimes when people need the assistance and uh, it was a, it was a very dangerous scenario. Yeah, that's that messaging. Like I said, messaging means everything. Messaging during COVID-19 has been, in my opinion, catastrophic, right? Because all these different parties have gotten involved and it's like, oh, please just listen to the emergency manager. Like the, the best governors I've seen, like the best governor I've seen so far, probably for a while was the, the governor in Ohio. He would get up there and he would say, this is the person from public health. This, she's a doctor. She's going to talk. And he would just go up there and support her or the, the governor in, um, I think Vermont literally would never say anything Sit up there with his mask on and the, the person would give the report and, you know, just to show that support. And I was like, that's how it should be in a disaster. Um, and, you know, thinking about like those different stakeholders for the different people who have, have those voices, um, you know, as you were talking earlier, it reminded me of, um, what was it, Louisiana during uh, Hurricane Katrina. We had, again, another politician come out there and say, hey, uh, if you, if you're looting, um, we, we're going to, we're going to take you to jail, you know, or, uh, another one was, we're going to shoot on site. Well, they didn't have comms in a tri-state area. There was not a single person in Louisiana who's going to hear that message. And so it was, a, it was a purely a political move, right? Sounding, you know, like they, they had control or whatever. And so like, it makes me think like emergency management you know, we, we're not going to get political here, obviously, but emergency managers have to coordinate between local res resources, including media and uh, politicians who their job, part of their job is to keep their job and to look like they have control. And so in external affairs, do you, do you often say to yourself like, oh, I wish they coordinate with me or are you constantly having to fight that battle or do you find that, it, that they're coming to you for questions first? How does that relationship work? Yeah, so I think it's a good mix of both, right? Um, so I, I think one of the things I remember most about the 2017 um, hurricane and, and wildfires was a contingent of members of Congress, bipartisan, um, coming uh, from the Hill to the NRCC. And I remember Brock sitting down and, and talking with them about all of the challenges that we were facing and holistically across the board, what, what this all meant, right? For the agency, for the people that were deployed, it was about maybe 20, 30 days after Hurricane Maria hit. And uh, one of the senators that was sitting there looked at him and said, that's all well and great, but you're not telling me what the human level impact of that was, right? 
Um, of course, as we knew, sometimes they would have uh, media lined up to interview them as soon as they got out of the meeting, um, I think. But one of the things that was so unique about Brock, um, and I would argue P. Gainer as well, running the agency, was it was always very human. It was always talking about, you know, what the impacts were um, to the people that we were serving. Survivors first was always the mantra. Um, you know, so even if it wasn't a message that a congressional member would want to hear, they were very transparent about what the impacts were, if it was negative, what we were doing to try and overcome that challenge. Um, and one of the things that both, um, both administrators did uh, during my tenure there was solicit their help, right, because they have a direct line to their constituents. So be a part of the solution. Um, I think one of the struggles I realized when I was working on Capitol Hill, um, we had actually a, a brush fire in our district. I worked for a member of Congress in, in Central Texas. And one of the challenges I think members want to get so members of Congress want to get so involved in the process when in reality, with a disaster declaration process, they don't really have a formal seat at the table. Um, so really what what I think Brock and Pete did very well was utilize them to be um, amplifiers of the information that we were trying to put out there and, and bring them into the fold of the process that way. Um, so they could get the most timely and accurate information to their constituents because really that's what mattered at the end of the day. Um, there were going to be people that made it political, uh, no matter no matter what side of the aisle you're on. There were um, bipartisan disagreements sometimes with the way that you know FEMA would have to administer things or decisions that FEMA made during a response. Um, but I think at the end of the day, looping back and making sure that they were as much a part of the process as they could be to get the accurate information to their constituents, that's what I think made it as effective as it as the, as they were. I will tell you, um, the first time a politician called me and asked me for information, I was totally shocked by um, by their demeanor. I mean, the, the, the national media versus when they called me and said, hey, I want to help. How do I help? And I was like, I'm the GIUL. Like, like why are you calling me? But, um, you know, he responded with, you know, basically I said that in, more, in a nicer way. But he was like, I need to know how many children were impacted and I need to know what I can do. And I was I was blown away by that. I really was. And uh, and then the persona from somebody else in another disaster, you know, they they look like they're for the people or whatever. And they called me and they're like, hey, are my constituents impacted by this? Like, do I actually have to worry about this? And I was like, that's kind of a kind of a weird way to, to put that. And that would happen more like that happened like maybe five or six times. So like the, there's always this persona and then there's like the person behind the persona. And uh, I, I was really grateful to have those experiences and to, to learn about like messaging in that form. Like, what do you want your persona to be? Do you want your persona to be like, you know, fluffy or do you want your persona to be like, you know, you crack down on things and that really probably depends on um, their constituents and what they're looking for. But getting back onto message here a little bit with, ah, that's a good pun. Uh, with, uh, <laughs> that was not intentional. That's awesome. Uh, with, with external affairs, specifically in emergency management, let's talk about uh, this last year because I've kind of alluded to it a lot. You were a part of it in the beginning when it was kind of going well and you left and I'm sure who has ever had FEMA is doing a great job. But in terms of the overall message, the reason why I've been so critical is because I'll, I will watch a CDC um, report come out and you know they're giving the information and if you understand how data works it makes sense right data changes and that like especially in a pandemic you, you want to provide the most updated information but the messaging behind that you know we would get people like even emergency managers would be like like oh they're changing it so much like what what do I actually have to do like a mask important or mask not important you saw all these conflicting messages and especially in like the in the summertime and then they kind of rounded out. And then December, they said, well, actually, schools are totally fine to reopen because kids to kids are fine. It's really the teachers passing it to kids. It's, that's the problem. Like, you have so many different parties. And then one person makes a, a mistake, which is a big deal if they're elected official. You're at the helm. You should be aware of that. But they would make a mistake. And then they want to either take ownership to it or they would try to sweep it on the rug and it would just make people more. It's just like, it's just been crazy. It's been like the year of after actions for external affairs. Sure. So if, if you are going to talk specifically about coronavirus and say, like, if you're just going to grab everybody in external affairs by the shoulders and say, do this, what would your advice be to them? 
Yeah. Well, it's really timely that we're having this conversation now because actually it's been right about a year um, since FEMA took a, a lead role in the in the COVID response and, and activated the NRCC, um, you know, in support of that. So, uh, you know, it was funny. I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues and some of those challenges that we were working through a year ago <laughs> still exist mm. today, right? Um, I think what's super complicated about COVID is two factors. One, pretty much every federal government agency in some certain capacity has some sort of role under the national mm. response framework when it comes to a pandemic response like this. So I think that's one. I think the second biggest issue um, is the magnitude, the scale. Um, you really can't harken back to another event that had you know, all 50 states plus territories and, and the District of Columbia having a major disaster declaration simultaneously. And it's, yeah. it's a huge it's a huge undertaking. You know, so I think there was also, a, a, you know, some challenges, um, you know, HHS had taken on the main response role. Um, and uh, when FEMA integrated, trying to understand, you know, how we were integrating with a public health perspective was, was a bit of a challenge um, and how to manage that data and how to accurately convey that data to the public. Um, you know, I think one of the good things uh, was that when we were still able to go into the office, I think this was another challenge too, right? A lot of people were working remotely because of, in the early days, especially of the pandemic, the, the personal mitigation measures um, or the availability of, of the equipment to implement those measures wasn't in place. So you also had, you know, what you would normally have, everybody on the NRCC floor rallying around each other, trying to solve these challenges, you were doing them from a remote environment and not there speaking face-to-face -face and understanding the other person's side of the equation. Um, you know, so traditional ways that we had worked in, in disaster response really weren't working. I think one of the challenges um, and, and kind of one of the biggest areas for correction um, that I saw kind of goes back to um, making sure that the information is accurate before it goes out the door. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, knew? yeah, yeah, really. Right. <laughs> so, you know, so there is something to be said, timeliness versus accuracy, right? You have to be timely from a communications perspective in the world that we live in today. Um, like I mentioned earlier, social media and the 24 hour news cycle, you really don't have a lot of time to get that information out. However, if it isn't accurate, um, then you have a bigger problem on your hands than being a little bit late. Um, to the mm. party, you've got you've got a bigger problem that you've got to try and solve um, because any information that you're putting out to the public, especially in those early days of the of the pandemic, it was crucial that that information be accurate before it go out the door because people were almost hanging on every word um, at some of the press conferences and other things that were happening, and so it was really critical um, that accurate numbers, accurate information, accurate. Um, things that we were trying to tell the public to do, to take action on or to not take action on, please don't do X, Y, or Z. Um, you know, that information had to be succinct, it had to be timely and it had to be accurate. And I think with any type of disaster, but especially something like this, um, you know, where it's so widespread, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a big challenge in the beginning. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the end of February, I knew that the, the national strategy that we had developed in 2014 through 2016 that I'd worked on was not, there was a different direction was being followed. Mm -hmm. And so I, based off of that, those previous uh, discussions in that task force, I said, okay, this is going to be a long-term thing. It's going to be a really long-term thing. And uh, when like, it was like four weeks and then it was, uh, you know, Hey, maybe the, the end of May, and then it was uh, the summer. Then all of a sudden kind of the, the rabbit came out of the hat and said, Hey, this is going to be two years. And even now, the messaging is difficult because we're getting messages like, well, anybody who wants a vaccination will be able to get one by the end of May. That's a really hopeful statement. And that's, that's encouraging. I, I hope that's true. But in terms of data, in terms of accuracy information, again, it comes back to really conflicting. It encourages people to open up and, uh, you know, stop mandates. It open it. it and, and so when they don't do that, it's like, why are you not doing that? And so there's, it just becomes this constant conflict. And um, like, I, I agree a hundred percent. It's all about accuracy. I love how you said, you know, in, in a 24 hour news cycle, you have to be timely, but you have a bigger problem if it's not accurate. I, I like to say that the, the media can be inaccurate as much as they want, but as a federal agency or as a, even a local agency, you have to be accurate. And, um, you, you know, like that, that happens a lot. I think FEMA takes a lot of 
courage, and I've been really impressed by this, that every single person in FEMA is allowed to talk to the media. I was, I was shocked by that when I joined FEMA. And um, I'm impressed by that because FEMA employees have done a, such a good job of presenting FEMA well. You look at Brock Long and you look at Gaynor, and you look at all, you know, all these people who, who, you know, the, the top, right, yourself, who've been able to keep that persona of professionalism and accuracy while dealing constantly with this beast of burden that wants information and not necessarily providing the right information. And so right. what do you do then if, you know, for example, we had the internal side in Hurricane Harvey where I had to figure out where this map came from so we could, uh, for external affairs, Jackie was able to put out a message to the media saying that map is not from FEMA. It's been doctored. And so they were able to corral that. So there's all this pieces moving in the, in the background. How do you, do you actually have a task force or, sh or should there be a task force that's specifically assigned to rumor control? You talked about a web page. How does that work? Yeah. So um, we had, uh, at the time of Harvey, we had a team that was literally dedicated, our strategic communications team that was just dedicated to focusing on what the state and local issues were at the, any given moment and how people were reacting to them on, on social media. Um, we practice what was called social listening, um, which is an incredibly helpful tool during a disaster because you're, you're working to understand what actions are being taken by the public on the ground and how you can work to solve any challenges that they may be facing. Um, you know, so we had about a, a 15 person team that was strictly dedicated to um, you know, paying attention to social media, what FEMA, what um, the local and state agencies have been tagged in, um, anything that was trending and being able to analyze that data, get it to responders who were making decisions in the NRCC or back in, you know, Texas or Florida or um, Virgin Islands or Puerto Rico and be able to inform them about what we were seeing as a trend and maybe be ahead of a challenge um, or at least be a little bit more timely with whatever we were going to respond to. Um, from the rumor control perspective, it was really great to have it all on one page. And I think what we did really well um, when FEMA got as, as involved as we did during, during the COVID response, um, not only were we putting rumor control information out there, but we were also putting best practices. Um, the continuous improvement team within FEMA did a great job of working across the federal government to pull together resources in one location that the public could actually, um, and that was linked to coronavirus.gov. So every single government site that had something to do with COVID, you know, kind of linked either back to COVID um, or coronavirus.gov or FEMA.gov, um, which was hugely important um, because people were pinging those pages constantly to look for information. Um, so not only did you have the rumor control, what's true and not true, True, but then you also had best practices here. If you're having this challenge, here's something to help you overcome it. Um, that was the first time that we had did something real time like that um, in a response. And, and the kind of receipt that we got from that from state and local governments who were all trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. Because um, you had about 54, 55 different playbooks for how to do it in the beginning, not to mention all the different local playbooks you had, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I thought that was a really critical piece of the messaging component too. Um, things that you don't, you know, necessarily think about as being communications really are involved in the response in a really integral way. Um, dot, you know, dotting the lines between the responders and those that are communicating to your point about, you know, any person within FEMA can communicate in their capacity about the work that they are doing. Um, the way I like to put it is the people that are in the field are on the front lines. They're the best people to be able to tell the story of the agency. You know, me sitting in my position at, at FEMA headquarters, I wasn't there on the ground responding to things, right? So I could talk to the, you know, national media all the time about what was actually happening, um, but it's the people that are there um, that can actually tell the story of what is happening. Um, and so uh, I encouraged a lot more media integration during my time, uh, both on the NRCC floor, that was kind of a, an unforeseen bubble that the media really didn't know about. We had our NRCC studio, but they didn't really know what happened you know, there and seeing the coordination. So we allowed them in for the first time um, when I was there. The other thing I encouraged was media embeds, was embedding with teams that were actually working on the ground and being able to better tell the story. 
um, you know, that was a little bit of a challenge in 2017, especially with stuff like Maria, where you where it was very difficult to even get around the, the island at a certain point. But in 2018 and 2019, we really put an emphasis on, you know, opening up the aperture a little bit, letting them see so that we could get a little bit more of an accurate portrayal of what was actually happening. Um, and the relationships I think that we built and fostered with the media as a result of that um, was every story rainbows and butterflies. No, it's never going to be in a disaster, but at least it allowed them to better understand the work that we were doing as emergency managers. Cause I think it often, you know, is kind of uh, a confusing scenario for people who, who haven't worked in the field. Yeah. I always feel like I have to give a dissertation of like what I do, like, Oh, you're a firefighter. Yeah. No, I'm not really a firefighter. <laughs> Oh, you're a doomsday prepper. No, I'm not really a doomsday prepper either. So uh, it's, that's a great point. And um, uh, one thing I'm curious about from an external affairs perspective, um, this, this thought that, um, do, you ever, do you ever look back and be like, wow, I'm surprised that they didn't jump on that? Or like, oh, that was what they harped on? Like, there was, like, for example, Hurricane Harvey. We're always talking about Hurricane Harvey, right? Especially this episode. Hurricane Harvey was the most catastrophic hurricane in U.S. history. Cat 4 on four days, single state, broke numerous records. I mean, 700,000 homes that were impacted, 1.2 million homes that had claims. And we, we, we talked about all these different things, floodplains that, you know, we evacuated entire towns. Um, there, was a, there was a factory that was going to go underwater that if it mixed with the water taper was going to be really bad. And so, you know, I ra ran over to the FCO when I saw that data and said, we got to evacuate. And so, he coordinated with um, Air Ops and the National Guard, and they literally evacuated the entire town in like three hours. It was insane. And then Hurricane Maria hits, and Hurricane Maria was catastrophic for sure. But it was catastrophic for a lot of reasons, including not updating their critical infrastructure for 50 years and a local government who, let's be honest, like they just suck. Like, I I'm allowed to say that. You you you're nicer than I am, but. They did. They, they sucked. And uh, they thought FEMA was the firefighters. They, they had no idea about that, of that process. And they live on an island. So let's not even get to that. But uh, like, it's, sometimes it's surprising to me, like um, Paradise, Paradise Fires, you know, is a great example. Um, Mina didn't harp against FEMA on that, which is good. But they kind of harped on Mendocino Complex. And Mendocino Complex also went really, really well. Like they did a great job in the response. And so, like, just like looking at those different examples, um, are you able to tell, like, oh, okay, this is going to be a thing, or are you ever surprised when it is a thing? Does that make sense? That yeah. Makes sense? Yeah. Um, there were a lot of times where you know something would happen in a in a response, and I'm trying to think of like a, a specific example, but um, you know things that maybe we thought, hey, this is kind of run of the mill. Um, you know, it, it was it was became more of a challenge. I think especially um, what I, I felt like I lost sight of a little bit in some of those events, you know, we get so sucked into what's happening at the national level, especially at FEMA headquarters when we're, you know, we're in a response like that. Um, when you've got a big event like that, the national media tends to, you know, cover, but um, the local coverage of something, right, is, is something that we really started to tap into a little bit more, um, you know, in, in 2018 and beyond, um, because that really was where people were getting their information. Okay, fine, turn on the Foxes, the CNNs, the MSNBCs of the world, um, and you're going to, you're still going to have a lot of people tuning in there, but a lot of people still tend to get their news from their local papers, from their local TV stations, from their local radio stations. And so we really started to make a concerted effort uh, to, to really cater and, and make um, our senior officials available to do those types of interviews as well. Um, because that's really, you are speaking directly to the audience, you know, those that are being impacted or those in the surrounding communities who can help them. Um, you know, so that was one thing I did to kind of overcome some of the, the buzz you get around, you know, the mis and disinformation, um, you know, sometimes is, is really trying to get very targeted um, in our outreach and, and our connectivity to those, those local jurisdictions that are being impacted by the event. Oh, good point. Good point. So what about, how do you determine when you don't need to care about an issue? Media says stuff all the time. How do you be like, well, whatever, we'll just move on from that one. Yeah. You know, um, sometimes you can, uh, 
you can try and solve an, a problem with a with a media outlet if they're if they're you know still going to run a story. At least you know you tried, right? So um, you know one of the things that I think FEMA got really good at um, is if there was an inaccurate story um, or um, there was an accurate coverage, being able to tell our own story, um, writing a letter to the editor saying this was inaccurate and here's why, or putting out a tweet and saying actually the, here's the real story and linking to a FEMA blog that we would write that told our side of the story. You're never going to have um, a situation and I, and I think you know every every story has two sides I've, I've, and probably more than that I realized throughout my, my time of the past three years with FEMA. But um, you know, I think it's really important for the agency to continue to tell the story of what they do day in and day out, um, because I think that is where the challenges arise. You know, people really don't understand what the role of the Federal Emergency Management Agency is and how vast it is. Um, you know, I know that you've covered a lot of those topics, you know, here on, on the podcast, but people don't really understand the breadth and depth of all the issues. You've got FEMA responding to, recovering from disasters. You have them issuing billions of dollars for uh, preparedness grant programs and active threat. You've got um, them running the national flood insurance program. So, um, you know, telling that story in a very holistic way is a challenge. And so every opportunity that you can to highlight the FEMA workforce and the work that they're doing um, and, and standing up, you know, against inaccurate information is, is really important, especially in that role. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. It's also kind of a good pivot point to uh, talk about Haggerty. Like I yeah. said, I, I'm a big fan of Haggerty. Um, everybody knows that I'm the owner of Doberman Emergency Management Group, of course. And uh, we work with Haggerty for sure because we're a big fan. And um, Haggerty is able to get in, you know, a giant workforce, especially search capacity. I don't really do search capacity. They kind of do like the one-off plans, that kind of stuff. The STS plans, but um, what Haggerty has been able to figure out is, is this complex process, and probably it's because you guys keep on grabbing everybody from FEMA. <laughs> so smart, um, smart from a from a logistics standpoint. Um, but let's talk about Haggerty and what Haggerty can provide, and why essentially, or uh, from a communications perspective for Haggerty, what would you want emergency managers to hear around the country of of the services you provide? Yeah, absolutely. So I think Haggerty is really unique in the fact and, and why I decided to come to Haggerty is there's no one size fits all way that we approach challenges, right? Every client that we have or every person that comes to us and, and wants some sort of um, consultation or solution, we really try and think innovatively and out of the box, making sure that all of the I's are dotted and T's are crossed to meet that specific need. Um, and that's really what was encouraging as I was um, getting to understand Haggerty and, and the way that the company worked. Um, and I think that is really important um, because uh, the company uh, incorporated in, in 2002. Um, so we're rapidly approaching our, our 20 year anniversary, which is incredible. Um, awesome. you know, I was, yeah, I was the first uh, communications director to come in uh, full time and, and fulfill this role. And I think what was really exciting oh. about it is there's, yeah. That's um, surprising. That's, that's actually really surprising. Yeah. So, you kind of had to make the ship up, right? Like you built the ship. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so I've been here for almost nine months now. Um, and what's really awesome about it is we continue to grow. I think um, Haggerty is starting to be seen um, even more so. It was before, but even more so now as we continue to grow our brand um, as a real thought leader in emergency management and, and homeland security space. Um, and it's it's been um, you know a challenge, but also really rewarding um, to see what the work that I did at FEMA, how that has translated into, you know, our clients, state and local governments mainly, but even some private sector businesses, how they're taking that information and what they're doing with it, what the output and product is. And we're helping them get to the implementation phase of a lot of these, a lot of these programs. Um, you know, something that I think is, is not as known about Haggerty, uh, we have branched really far into the public health and, and, um, uh, healthcare world uh, during the COVID uh, response and, and recovery. Uh, we brought in um, a head of healthcare programs, which has been great. Um, and, and he's uh, been helping over 100 hospitals and healthcare systems nationwide oh. as they respond to and recover from COVID. You know, so really, you know, I like to say not only do we help people, you know, prepare for, respond to, recover from, and mitigate against disasters, um, but we're really branching out. Um, you know, I think in a in a traditional management consulting sense, 
um, and really helping people solve unique challenges, no matter what they may be facing. Um, the financial aspect of a lot of these things trickles down into multifacets within communities and, and Haggerty is there really to, to be a solution and help communities think through, you know, what they're entitled to from a federal perspective, um, you know, and how to, how to make their communities more resilient. I like to say that emergency managers or the emergency management organizations are the only organizations in government who truly know how to work with community, as in all these sta different stakeholders, all these different components. And I think one of the after actions of uh, COVID is that public health forgot the public side. <laughs> like they don't know how to work with the public. They, they look at, Brock said it great. He said they, they folk, or it wasn't Brock, it was um, Earl Stoddard. He said they're really great with understanding long-term trends. That's what they focus on. And, and Brock kind of pivoted off of that too. And he said, you know, that's not in their daily brief of like how to deal with the pandemic. So they haven't focused on that at all. Only emergency managers can do it. And I think it's great that Haggerty has gone in there and say, we can provide people who actually know how to work with the public. You focus on the health part. We're going to go in there with, with work with the public. Um, the National I Met West, the team that I was on right before I, well, before I joined the team, um, I was working at uh, the National Cancer Institute and we were housing all the Ebola patients. CDC was bringing them into the country to, to be able to test it, to be able to be tested. And uh, so the IMAT West was uh, focusing at CDC while I was doing with the, dealing with the patients on the NIH campus. And, there, you know, there was all these different components there. I didn't coordinate with uh, the IMAT West at all. But hilariously enough, but I did coordinate with the CDC. And so there, the fact that I met West went in there and was able to embed and say, like, this is how you do this to make sure that you don't have a, a problem was a really good after action that I honestly don't think was used during the pandemic. But now that Haggerty has gone in there and they're working with public health and they're working with hospitals, um, I think that's incredibly important. I think every anytime you have a response, there's going to be several stakeholders involved. And the more you can get people who understand that level of uh, work, who can do search capacity, like let, let's be real, like Haggerty does really great with bringing in a bunch of people real fast and say, we're going to fix your problem. And so it's all about search capacity. And with the 100% cost share that's happening right now with COVID, you guys can just jump in there really fast and get the job done for people. And that's excellent. Um, but uh, yeah, good call outs there for, uh, for public health and, um, to, to make sure that they're working with that. And I think uh, that's really cool that you've had to build this ship in nine months. That's amazing that they didn't have a comms director for almost 20 years. So, I mean, that's cool. It's, it shows that they're entering into a new phase of, yeah. of, of operation. Um, so if, the, if they're trying to get into these new spaces and branding, let's talk about branding from, again, that emergency management perspective. You're getting into emergency management. I took a bunch of PIO classes, public information <laughs> officer classes in school. I thought it was a lot of fun, but we didn't really talk about branding. And um, could you give advice to emergency managers out there, especially those who are studying a PIO, um, of how of, of presentation style? Now, don't don't harp on my podcast. Don't talk about like, oh, don't put the sign super high above you because that's really bad for a video camera. By the way, that's super stupid. But I love <laughs> this sign, so it's how it's how it goes. But let's talk about branding for a second. How do you do branding? Yeah. So um, one of the biggest challenges I think I had when I was external affairs director at FEMA was everything, especially when you have 10 FEMA regions, you have headquarters, you have all these field offices that are doing different things. Um, consistency and look and feel and having the public understand the authoritative information, the source and, and who's talking, right? You had had a flood map that was doctored, right? And it's, it's, it's easy to kind of do those things, but when you build a consistent brand and people come to know the information and what you're putting out, it's a lot easier to make sure that stuff that's accurate is actually going out the door. Um, so one of the biggest efforts that we undertook um, uh, during uh, Director Gaynor's tenure um, was we overhauled everything from even the what FEMA would present in a PowerPoint presentation all the way to what the website was, um, to infographics, to how you could use the logo, um, everything under, under the sun, um, to start to build that consistency and the look and the feel, videos, um, all of those things. And I think what it did was really um, 
elevate the way that we were communicating with the public, having the consistency um, from the brand perspective, but what people could know to expect in the messaging, the types of messaging that we were putting out, um, getting consistent with uh, every video had an infographic suite coming with it to help you know the public better understand or have state and local governments be able to use that information and rebrand it with their logos. Um, having those conversations and, and working with PIOs at the state and local level too was really, really crucial. Um, you know, here at Haggerty, uh, we're, we're gradually continuing to grow um, our brand. We have a consistent way that we communicate and, and stylistic things that the firm the firm does. And we're continuing to grow that now um, that I'm on board. Um, and it's really exciting because I think, um, you know, the way that we put information out there, people come to, to expect that type of uh, communication from Haggerty, the thought pieces, the blogs, the, um, you know, kind of infographics, uh, supporting a lot of our clients um, and doing a lot of those same work. Um, so it's been really exciting to kind of watch gradually over time, you know, in both tracks, what I did at FEMA and kind of now, um, you know, what I'm doing here with Haggerty, um, continuing to grow that brand through consistency, I think is, is really critical. Yeah, consistency is the name of the game. Um, I'm really lucky because the person I married is obviously the most phenomenal person on earth and she's pretty <laughs> smart for marrying me, but uh, I, I always talk myself up. I have this stupid podcast. Uh, it's not a stupid podcast. I love everybody for tuning in. I have this podcast <laughs> that I love and I get to talk to really interesting people, but I kind of talk myself up, right? Like I'm kind of a prideful guy. Let's be real. My wife is extremely humble. She's probably the most humble person I've ever met. And yet like when people talk to her, they say, you know, like, Oh, what do you do? She says, Oh, I'm a designer. What she doesn't say is like, Oh, I did the Ritz Carlton free branding. Yeah. I did the Academy Awards. I did sous vide magazine. Like she has some really big accolades to her name. So if you're looking for a branding, there you go. But, uh, <laughs> But like, seriously, it made me uh, like a, a really small business owner who was, who just, I, I, I didn't want to travel, you know, 50 weeks a year anymore. I wanted to be able to focus on the different projects. And first, by the way, Haggerty is really great with that because you get to work with Haggerty, uh, anybody who wants to get hired by Haggerty, you know, you can have 50 different projects on your resume and it's really cool to do that. But um, I have, I'm a little bit more free and in, in, in determining which projects I get to work on, whether it's Haggerty or not, but either way uh i got really lucky because i basically begged my wife and said hey this is really below your pay grade here but could you could you help me out and she's like it's all about consistency so we have we have the sign by the way she made that sign for me i begged her to make the sign right. she did it by hand which is incredible um but like we got the shirt we got you know if you look at our website everything's extremely consistent and it shows a level of pro uh, professionalism it shows a level of detail that's necessary and so if you're an emergency manager and you're starting on a really small agency and you're, you want to be taken seriously, stop trying to put like every hazard on, a, on, a, on your, on your messaging, figure out what your, you know, what the logo is versus all the different types of branding. Get your, get used the same format, use the same, just everything. That's kind of going into the weeds a little bit, but um, even the font, like font and font size, just like make everything extremely consistent and you'll be able to be more impactful both internally and externally, because people look at that and they say, okay, this person's a professional. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, I, I think that's um, a good call out. And hopefully I gain, gain some points with my wife there. <laughs> it's amazing. After I said the sign was stupid. I, okay. Real talk though. Like the placement of the sign is pretty bad. My wife told me to put it right here. I was like, no, I'll be great behind. And then everybody comes on here like yourself and it's like perfect framing. And I'm like, <laughs> Hey, I'm like the small guy in the back. Um, but I'm also fat. So this, this helps us. <laughs> Maybe I should edit this out. I don't know. But uh, either way, like branding is so important. And, um, you know, I just want to thank you again for coming on the show. You, you brought up so many excellent points. But before I let you go, I got to ask, right, if you're going to change one thing in emergency management, what would you change, especially from an external affairs perspective? Yeah, I think one of the things that's the biggest challenge, um, especially from, you know, an external affairs perspective is, um understanding the roles and responsibilities before something happens, right? Um, I think one of the things that we could do a lot better in the emergency management space, especially from a communications perspective, is bringing all the partners to the table um, to really exercise how you're going to overcome challenges in communication before the event happens. Um, you know, I think we always get so caught up in the moment and whatever the current 
situation is. Um, but taking those lessons learned and really applying them and making sure that we're continuing to get better. Um, you know, I think FEMA does a really good job with that, but I think it could be even more. I think that was one of the things I walked away from uh, my time at the agency, wishing we could have done more was solve some more of those challenges that we realized existed during exercise play. So that when we're actually getting to the scenario itself, um, you know, God forbid, you know, we, we don't have a catastrophic earthquake scenario anytime soon, knock on wood. But, um, you know, exercise how you're going to communicate because it's going to change exponentially. You're not going to have your cell phones potentially. You're not going to have the internet to be able to do that. Um, and so thinking through those types of challenges is is really where I think my passion lied, um, you know, in the agency and, and something that I'd like to see continue to grow as a field. I think that's a great call out. The On every single app or action that I've ever seen, communications is always like, oh, communications. And that means nothing. Let's be real. Like, does it mean your equipment or does it mean like coordination? But at, at the same time, like on most, I've seen it one time, one time in FEMA, they did it really great. But most agencies I've worked with, um, communications and external affairs is a really small or, or to be honest, forgotten piece of full scale exercises. And like, I cannot stress this enough. I've been doing it for a year now. If your messaging is screwed up, whatever the, the event is, you will have a disaster. And like everybody needs to focus and get on, um, on point with this. Everybody needs to get on point with messaging. It changes the course of disasters every time. If you want to help people out faster, if you want to get them the right phone number, as you called out, they're, they're how, like, like it's life-saving. It really is. It's life-saving. It's not, it's not like, oh, I'm going to put my, on my social media posts for fun. It's, Hey, if you want to recover from a disaster, you just lost your home. This is what you do. And, and messaging, it really comes down to that. So again, great call out. So Jesse, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Absolutely. Uh, we got to get you come back on and you can give us some more advice. I'm sure we'll get lots of people to, to ask you questions. And so th what typically happens is we get an email at info at governmentemg.com where people ask questions. That happens a lot. We appreciate those people. However, if you want to make it public so everybody can respond to that, there's a couple different ways. We've been using LinkedIn lately, so you can check out that. But our main page is uh, the Disaster Tough Podcast on Instagram, so make sure you go to that. We're also on Facebook, obviously, Disaster Tough Podcast again. If you liked this episode, if you want to give it a five-star rating, you should. Uh, and subscribe. Make sure you do that. Tune in next week for our next episode. Thanks again.